the Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to lesson 87 on the distance education program in chemistry for lower kids science. I am learning in room innocence and I'm your chemistry teacher. We are still on the topic matter, properties and transformation. We are teaching the subtopic organic chemistry one. Now this subtopic organic chemistry one will be treated in the following part. We have organic chemistry and classification of organic compounds. We have separation, purification and identification of organic compounds. We have functional groups and homologous series, nomenclature and isomerism. Then we have determination of structure. We have types of organic reactions. We have chemistry of hydrocarbons and pollution from organic compounds. And then we have uh, reduction and integration. Now this part, preparation, purification and identification of organic compounds be treated in two lessons. These are preparation and purification of organic compounds, which is our lesson of today. Then we have identification of elements in organic compounds. Now before beginning today's lesson proper, I'd like us to correct the assignment we had at the end of our previous lesson. Correction of assignment. Question one, we find the following. We have hybridization and then we have delocalization. So what is hybridization? What is hybridization? Hybridization is a mixing of mixing of few atomic orbitals. We have few atomic orbitals to form orbitals of the same energy called hybrid orbitals. So during hybridization, atomic orbitals blend or mix to produce new orbitals that are called hybrid orbitals. And all the hybrid orbitals, like in this kind of hybridization, do have the same energy level. So the hybrid orbitals are of the same energy level. So we go to what is delocalization? Define delocalization. Delocalization or bond delocalization is simply the spreading of pi bonds. We have pi bonds over a number of atoms in a molecule. So take note, only pi bonds can spread. Sigma bonds will not spread. So delocalization is simply the spreading of pi bonds over a number of atoms in a molecule. Now question two, name the type of hybridization undergone by carbon atom A, B, C and D. This is a compound. We have carbon atom A, B, C and D. So what is the type of hybridization undergone by those four carbon atoms? Now we start by drawing the structure of that molecule. You see the structure? The structure of this carbon atom A there, B and B is involved in a double bond. C is involved in a triple bond and D is also involved in a triple bond. So looking at the, the type of bond formed, single, double and triple bond, this kind of hybridization has been exhibited by A, B, C and D. E. Now we move. Carbon atom A has undergone sp 3 hybridization. We saw in the previous lesson that when carbon atom forms single bonds in a compound, only single bonds, and they exhibit the covalency of four, that is by forming four single, single bonds, would have undergone sp 3 hybridization. Now, when uh, in carbon atom B, we have sp 2 hybridization. We saw that when carbon atom undergoes sp 2 hybridization, there are three hybrid orbitals, three sp 2 hybrid orbitals that are formed. Now there will be one pi orbital that is unhybridized and will involve in the formation of one pi bond. So any carbon atom that has a double bond will have undergone sp 2 hybridization. We go now to carbon atom C. Carbon atom C is involved in a triple bond. Now carbon atoms involved in triple bonds will undergo sp hybridization. 
That is the blending of an X orbital and a P orbital to form two X2 hybrid orbitals. Now, when this happens, two of the three orbitals are not involved in hybridization, they are left unhybridized, and the two of them overlap with those of other atoms to form two pi bonds, giving us a, a, a triple bond. That is one sigma bond and two different pi bonds. So, all carbon atoms involved in triple bond have undergone X2 hybridization. So, D is also X2 hybridization. So, this is a type of hybridization undergone by the four carbon atoms in the structure as you can see on your screen. Our lesson is in 7 is cited preparation and purification of organic compounds. And the outline of this lesson is as follows. We have objectives, we have prerequisites, problem situation, we have preparation and purification of organic compounds as the lesson proper. Then we move to evaluation and then we have an assignment. The objective. Now, by the end of this lesson, we should be able to understand this law and state the importance of this law. We also be able to state and explain the different ways to purify organic compounds. And we should be able to explain the criteria of purity. Prerequisites. In order to effectively understand this lesson, you must have mastered the lesson. On, uh, you must have mastered preparation techniques from the first cycle, we must have also mastered the lesson on introduction to organic chemistry. Problem situation. Lemon grass, commonly known as fever grass, is widely used to treat digestive tract spasm. Stomach is pain, common cold fever, just to name a few. A master student in chemistry was given a task to boil lemon grass or fever grass with water extract the lemongrass essential oil and determine the number of bioactive components in the lemongrass essential oil. Now on your screen you can see a picture around the lemongrass, commonly known as vagrass, is very common, we use it often as seed. And then there, there, can, there can be an extract, extraction of the essential oil from this lemongrass and this is why you have lemongrass essential oil, it's very important and it has a lot of health benefits as, as you could see in the question. Uh, in the situation. So question A, now, name two separation, separation techniques that a master student can use to be able to separate the essential oil from the mixture of the mixture of things after boiling the lemon grass. Because the task was to boil the lemon grass with water and extract the essential oil. So what are, the, what are two separation techniques that the master student could use in this uh, extraction or separation of the oil, essential oil from the other part of the lemongrass and water. Now B, by which method can the student determine the number of bioactive components in the lemongrass essential oil when you need to explain? So we are going to come back to the solution of this real life situation towards the end of this lesson. So I ask you to be focused if you will be able to give answers to this question. Preparation of organic compounds. Now organic compounds are usually prepared Organic reactions, sorry, are usually very slow. They are slow at room temperature compared with inorganic reactions. And so to increase their speed or to make them comparable to inorganic reactions, we usually heat them or we use catalyst. And now heating of organic compounds is not usually done like this of inorganic compounds. With organic compounds, we use a method called reflux. Reflux. Now what is reflux? Reflux is simply a process of boiling a liquid so that any vapor is liquefied and returned into the stock solution. That is, we are heating a liquid vapor uh, that is the liquid boiled and then there's evaporation, but the vapor does not escape into the atmosphere. It is recondensed and sent back into the reaction mixture. And now the apparatus used to carry out reflux is known as a reflux condenser. We are seeing you can have a picture of the reflux condenser. This is a reflux condenser. Now, the mixture, when it's being boiled, the vapor is fixed, it's condensed back and sent into the liquid. And sent back into the liquid mixture. So, this is a setup or the apparatus is to carry out reflux. Now, advantages of reflux. Now that we are using reflux to feed in organic chemistry, what advantages do we have when we are using reflux compared to other heating techniques? Now, reflux ensures that the reaction goes to completion. In that case, it prevents the escape of volatile components. Again, that you are boiling something that the solvent is very volatile. It will vaporize and evaporate and go into the atmosphere. 
and then you need to constantly replace because when you evaporate the reaction may not be effective again and redox cuts takes us the time to keep on replacing the solvent and ensure that our reaction goes to completion now it also prevents flame accidents in the case where that solvent that is volatile is inflammable now it will not come in contact with fire and cause fire accidents so redox cuts to prevent fire accidents now purification of organic compounds Our organic compounds can be purified by these methods that you have on the screen. We have recrystallization, solvent extraction, sublimation, simple distillation, chromatography, fractional distillation, and film distillation. The other method we will just consider these in this lesson. Let's begin with recrystallization. What is recrystallization? Now, recrystallization is used to purify organic compounds. Now, in this compound, the mixture of the compound and impurity is dissolved in an appropriate solvent. In this crystallization, now we put an appropriate solvent to dissolve the mixture of the compound and the impurity that we need to separate from the organic compound. Now, the appropriate sol solvent must be that which readily dissolves the chemical that we want to purify and then leaving the impurity behind. So, the solvent that gets a source of solvent must readily dissolve the compound of interest, leaving the impurity behind. Now we see on the picture we have a compound and they are dissolving. Now upon dissolution, the compound of interest will dissolve and the impurity will remain in the course of the dissolution. Now the mixture, this mixture of the, the, the compound, the, the solvent and the impurity is filtered. Now the filtry is cool and the compound crystallizes out of the solution as the temperature is reduced. Now you can see this is the filtration, this mixture is filtered. Now this is the filter. This filter is cooled down by the reduction of temperature, and as it's being cooled, you see crystals are gradually being formed in the in the liquid in the conical flask. Now the crystals now are washed like bracket, washed and dry. You can remove them by filtration. You wash them and dry them to have the few crystals of the compound. So this one is recrystallization that needs to purify this compound. Now the second method is solvent extraction. Now, solvent extraction is used to purify organic compounds found in aqueous solution. So, we use solvent extraction to purify organic compounds that are dissolved in aqueous solution. Now, this solvent extraction is based on the fact that organic compounds are more soluble in organic solvents than aqueous solvents like water. So, that is why, what, uh, how solvent extraction comes into play. Now, let's look at the procedure of solvent extraction. Now, we place the aqueous mixture, that is the organic compound that is dissolved in water, in a separating funnel. Now, we see this is a separating funnel, the aqueous mixture, organic compound, and water. What we do is we add an organic solvent, maybe ether, our choice of solvent, and then we shake both. Now, as we are shaking, the organic compound, which is more soluble in the organic solvent than the aqueous solvent, will move from the aqueous layer to the organic solvent. So, it moves from the aqueous layer to the organic layer. And then we run out now the aqueous layer to the top. And then we have now our organic compound dissolved in the organic solvent. So you can see, and then we can distill the organic layer, the organic solvent, and then we have our organic compound. So we see on the screen how we add the organic solvent, this liquid, we add ether, then we shake. As we are shaking the mixture, the aqueous mixture, and the organic solvent, what happens is that the compound moves. From the aqueous layer, this aqueous layer moves from the aqueous layer to the organic layer. And then now we can then separate by allowing the aqueous layer to run through the tap. We collect it and then we'll be left now with the organic layer and the organic compound inside. We can then destroy this solvent and we'll, we'll be remaining with a few organic compound. Now let's go to sublimation. Now sublimation is a technique to purify compounds. Which sublime from impurities which do not sublime. If an organic compound can sublime, and they are, in the organic compound there are impurities that cannot sublime, we can readily use sublimation to purify the compound. So examples of compounds that sublime, when, we, when, I, when they are heated, we have benzoic acid and phenol. I have a picture of benzoic acid on your screen, crystals of benzoic acid. So these crystals can sublime on heating. Now let's look at the procedure of sublimation. Now the mixture is placed in a china dish or an evaporation dish. I'm talking about the mixture of the organic compound that's sublime and the impurity that does not sublime. We place them in an evaporation dish. 
Now, a filter funnel is inverted over the mixture in the evaporating base. And the mixture is heated or food involved. Upon heating, the compound will supply and then it will deposit on the colder part of the funnel. Now, the impurity that does not supply will remain in the evaporating base. As you can have on your screen, you have the evaporating base, the compound that's sublime and the impurity you have it in the base. Then when it's heated, as for example, this is benzoic acid, and that's why Canada is. When it's heated, before the heated, we have the inverted funnel placed over it. Then it is heated, the two compound benzoic acid will, will, will supply and deposit on the colder part of the funnel. You see this as the benzoic acid that has deposited on the colder part of the funnel. And then now we can quickly collect the two benzoic acids and would have purified benzoic acid by sublimation. Now we go to simple distillation. Now simple distillation is a technique used to purify volatile liquid from solid or non-volatile liquid. An example of liquid that could be set or purified by simple distillation we have a top D A T. A top D A T. And it's important to note that this technique is good to separate liquid that boil at a temperature lower than 140 degrees Celsius. Now the procedure for simple distillation is that the mixture, the empty mixture and the liquid form is placed in a round bottom flat and a condenser is connected to it. Now the mixture is heated. Upon heating, the volatile liquid is treated as a vapor. Now the condenser stays because of the condenser and it, and it collects as a distillate. Now all this will, will have now the impurity or the other compound that is not really volatile will stay back in the round bottom flat. On your screen, you have the setup is the empty mixture. We have a round bottom flat with being heated. The escaping vapor will pass through the condenser and will be condensed and collected as the distillate. And then the empty or the non volatile component will remain now in the flat. I would have purified this compound by simple distillation. We go now to fractional distillation, another purification technique or separation technique. Now, we seek to purify mixtures of two or more mixable liquids, which are closely different boiling points. We take note, we take liquids that are closely different boiling points. Now, we have examples, we have the different fractions, the petroleum fractions are separated by fractional distillation. A mixture of alcohol and water could also be be separated by fractional distillation. So these are examples of, of some petroleum uh, fractions. We have petroleum, petroleum, petroleum gases, just to name some. So to carry out fractional distillation, we also need a fractionating column to carry out this one. An example, we have a mixture of petroleum that because the heat is found on your screen. So when this fractional distillation is carried out on this petroleum or crude oil, you could have these various fractions coming out of them. Which are different uses. Now we go to the procedure for fractional distillation. The mixture is placed in a round bottom flat and a fractionating column is connected and a condenser. Fractionating column and the condensers are also connected to it. The mixture is treated upon heating. The more volatile component will be filled over at the top and will condense and it's collected at a distillate, leaving the, 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 the less volatile component in the flat. And they will subsequently vaporize and will be condensed after uh, the, when their temperature is also arrived at and there will be purification of, of the compound. So, this is a setup used to carry out fractional distillation. We have a fractionating column that helps us to separate those vapors based on their boiling point. And then it, it, is, it is condensed and collected as this is the living base that has higher boiling point remaining in the flat. I will subsequently also vaporize and will be collected. So we go now to uh, steam distillation. Now steam distillation is a technique that is used to purify high boiling point liquids which are immiscible in water from known volatile impurities. I repeat, we use it to separate high boiling point liquids which are immiscible in water with water from known volatile impurities. And examples of sorts we have volatile essential oils from plant materials. For example, the lemongrass. Uh, essential oil can also be extracted and separated from lemongrass by this method, by steam distillation. So it's important to know that this method is specifically used for purifying substances which decompose at or near their boiling point. 
So if a compound can easily decompose at its boiling point or near its boiling point, you can use steam distillation to do the situation. I have on the screen we have a plant matter and then we have the essential oil that is extracted from the plant matter by steam distillation. So we can use this one to effectively extract the essential oil from plant material. We move now to the procedure for steam distillation. Now the apparatus is set up and the steam is passed through the mixture because in steam distillation we actually use steam to cause the compound of interest to boil and then it's collected. Now, after that is set up and the steam is passed through the mixture, the volatile component will be filled and will be condensed. Now, the distillate, that is a mixture, now the distillate will be now a mixture of that compound that has vaporized and water. Because when water vapor is passed through, some of it will escape. As it's escaping, it will cause the liquid to boil and also vaporize the heat. And then the mixture of the component or the, 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 the compound and water will also condense and then it will, it will condense and form the distillate and it will be separated in a separating corner in case where they are not liquid and they will be extracted. So that is the procedure. You have on your screen the apparatus used to carry out steam distillation. Now this is a steam generator. Now when it's heated, water, if water when, when it boils it generates steam, the steam is bubbled through this flask containing the compound, the plant material that has been boiled. Then now uh the steam causes the, the essential component of it, be the essential oil to also boil. And it boils now, the mixture of steam and the vapor of the essential oil we want to separate, or the compound we want to separate, we pass through the condenser and we collect as distillate. As you look carefully, you discover there are two layers here. There's the aqueous or this water and that's the organic compound on top. So this extract now can be separated using a separation funnel. We have the essential oil and water, or the compound and water will be obtained. So chromatography is the next method. Now it's a technique used to purify mixtures based on the difference in affinity of their constituents. So the fixed thing, which is also known as the adsorbent, and the mobile phase, which is known as the element. So chromatography is to take a component in a mixture based on the affinity of those components to this fixed thing and the mobile phase. Now, there are two types of chromatography that we are going to see in the course of this lesson. We have column chromatography and paper chromatography. As you can have on your screen, we have uh, the component or the chlorophyll pigment in this. We have a green pigment here. We have a green that is not as thick as this. And we have a brown pigment in this other leaf. We can separate them by chromatography. Now, let's see column chromatography. Now, in column chromatography, the mixture is poured onto a column. I'm talking about the mixture that has to be purified. It's poured onto a column. And the column is usually a glass tube that is packed with an adsorbent material, for example, aluminum, that is aluminum oxide. Now, the solvent, that is the L1, is allowed to flow through the column. As it flows through the column, it dissolves some of the components of the mixture and carries them along. As it is flowing along, they will be absorbed at different levels along the column. You can have, for example, you have a column, we have a mixture of poured onto it, and the solvent is added, the element is added. As the element is flowing through the column, it will take the components of that mixture, you see some bands here. These bands are the separated bands of the compound. So each band stands for a component of that compound that is separated to the part. Then you see the mobile phase, the element that flows through the column. Now, we could Extract, we could extract each of these components, allow them to flow, and we will collect them at the, at the end through the tap as we will have separated the components from the mixture. Now, the components can be recovered by dissolving them out quickly with more elements and then evaporate, evaporating the elements to, to be left with the few uh, components. For example, if I want this red band, the compound that stands for this red band to be extracted from the compound, I will simply keep on adding the elements with dissolve it and carry it along and uh, eventually it will come out and I will collect it and I keep on adding another element to the green band standing for a component compound is also collected but I separated the component of this compound by column chromatography let's take the paper chromatography in the paper chromatography the mixture is applied near the bottom of a strip of paper and we most preferably we use the cellulose paper to carry out this one now, mixture is applied near the bottom of a sheet of paper, and the paper in this case now is our adsorbent. Now, it is used in a suitable solvent, and the solvent is our element as we go for for chromatography. 
Now, this solvent front rises up the paper by capillary action because there's no pores on the cellulose paper. Now, uh, as the, the element, the solvent is rising up through capillary action, it dissolves the various components of that compound and carries them along. And it's carrying them along, they are separated and they are being absorbed at different points on the paper. And we have different spots on the chromatographic paper. And you could see these are the, the, the dots of this compound placed at the bottom line of the paper. And it dips in a solvent, and the solvent is, being, is rising up by capillary action that is the element, it carries different components of the mixture. And it can have different colors and applications. So this is paper chromatography. Now, this component, the various components that dissolve, the component that dissolves more in the element will stay more below and will move a longer distance. So if you see, the component that moves higher up is the one that has a higher affinity for the element. The one that does not move at a higher distance is the one that has a lower affinity for the element, but the higher affinity for the adsorbent. That's how we could use to separate them. Now, these different components can be separated by cutting the band, the dot or the color, the paper stick that have them, and then we dissolve them out. And then we extract them. So we can also get this color, these different components by cutting these sheets, blue color, red color, and remove them and dissolve them in the solvent and then I extract them. That's how we can purify by paper chromatography. And it is important to know that in paper chromatography, the container is usually covered so that the atmosphere in the beaker is saturated with the solvent vapor. For example, two. We go with the empty cure, the multiple choice system. So we are going to choose the letter corresponding to the correct answer here. Now, question one, benzoic acid sublimes while oxalic acid does not. A mixture of benzoic acid and oxalic acid can be separated or purified by A, we have solvent extraction, B, steam distillation, C, sublimation, and D, the crystallization. Which of these methods can be used to purify this mixture to separate the mixture? Now, the answer is sublimation. Why? Because benzoic acid can sublime, while oxalic acid cannot. So then, uh, sublimation is a good method to purify that mixture. Question 2. In paper chromatography, the component of the mixture that travels faster off the paper, A, has a higher affinity for the stationary phase, B, has a higher affinity for the mobile phase, C, is polar in nature, and D, is non polar in nature. So, which of them is the correct answer? Now, the correct answer is B. The one that the component of the mixture that travels faster up the paper is the one that has a higher affinity for the mobile phone. That is the answer. Now let's go to criteria for purity. Now, two solids, for a solid to be pure, or two solids generally have a sharp melting point. See, they are solid, they have a sharp melting point. Now, what, uh, what does it mean to have a sharp melting point? Well, a sharp melting point means to melt over a temperature range of about 1 degree Celsius. And you should know that if you solid will melt within a range of about 5 degrees Celsius, but two solids have a sharp melting point, if you solids have, they don't have a sharp melting point. We can use it to test the purity of a solid. Now you can have on your screen a graph the heating of solid and it melts at a particular temperature. You see there's no risk it's a, at a particular temperature of at least 1 degree Celsius. It melts to give us a liquid. It's also a solid that has this kind of graph has a sharp melting point and it's a few solid. Now we can have two compounds also produce only a single spot on a chromatographic paper because they contain only a single component. Now if there are different spots, it tells us about the number of components found there. And there's only a single single spot, it means that the compound has only one component and it's also few. And if you compound to produce many spots with, to, uh, with respect to the different components they contain. Now you have on a chromato chromatogram. We have one spot there for a particular compound, meaning that the compound is a few compound. We go to two liquids. Two liquids, like solids, also have a sharp boiling point. That is a boil over a range of one degree Celsius. So we have a liquid and boiling, and it vaporizes or evaporates at a particular fixed temperature. Then that liquid is also a few liquid because it has a sharp boiling point. It's important to recall that. The flux is a process of boiling the liquid so that any vapor is liquefied and returned to the stock. The flux ensures that the reaction goes to completion, prevents the escape of volatile components, and prevents flame accidents. Now, depending on the nature of compound and the they contain, the following method, the method we just seen, can be used to purify them. We have the crystallization, solvent extraction, just to name some. Now, problem situation, the solution to the problem situation. 
the man grass commonly known as river grass is widely used to feed digestive tract spasms stomach pain common cold fever this name is new a master student is telling to start to boil lemon grass with water extract lemon grass essential oil and then the number of bioactive components in lemon grass essential oil so a main two sufficient techniques that the student can use is to take the essential oil from the mixture of obtain after boiling we have the make the, the sufficient techniques we have solvent extraction and seal distillation as we in the course of the lesson b by which method can the student determine the number of bioactive components explain now the method is chromatography now paper chromatography the number of spots on the paper chromatogram represent the number of bioactive components in the essential oil for column chromatography the number of bands on the column represent the number of bioactive components in the essential oil <laughs> So application, you know how well you have followed the lesson, I would like you to answer this question. So the different criteria for PUC. Now, answer, which one is half sharp melting point? That is, the ball at a temperature range of 1 degree Celsius. Two degrees also have a sharp boiling point. And uh, which one is half a sharp melting point? Two degrees have a sharp boiling point. Two compounds produce only a single spot on a chromatographic paper. Assignment, the part, next person would like you to answer this question. Define rate block and state two advantages of rate block. And question two, explain solvent extract, explain solvent extraction. Explain how solvent extraction can be used to purify organic compounds. The references we have chemistry, advanced level chemistry, chemistry in context, chemistry for IB diploma and ad complete advanced level chemistry. We have come to the end of this lesson and next lesson will be on identification of elements in organic compounds. See you in our next lesson. On a tege si, ma tege yop. On a tege minga, ma tege nyom. On a tege majang, ma tege ndom. Mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen. Gani bana, ma tege mot. Gani la kiri wa tege ndong. Esa kina bia jinki do. Mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen. Tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tam atonge tam zabike tam 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 amote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne injubya yen